Hi, everybody. It is good to be here. I am Carolyn Byers. I'm the Education Director at Madison Audubon Society. And well, we're still carrying on with online lessons. So um, usually I am out in the community teaching kids at community centers and at schools, teaching in person, <laughs> getting high fives and hugs. Um, but right now, we, even though the state of Wisconsin is slowly opening up, we're going to keep providing awesome educational programming online uh, because it can't hurt to keep going online, right? Um, okay, so you can find all of our materials on our website at madisonaudubon.org. And there's a whole special section called Safer and Funner uh, because well, we want to be safer and funner at home. Um, so you can find all of our lessons, games, activities, art projects. You can do bird yoga with me. All of that is on our Safer and Funner at Home webpage. Um, and today I'm going to be teaching you all about feathers. Um, so we're going to explore some feathers. I have a microscope to test out. We'll see how it works live. Maybe I'll be posting pictures in the comments later. We are going to do an experiment, and this is something that I think a lot of you can probably do at home. Um, and we are going to be doing eight-minute notes together. So if you want to join me for eight-minute notes, make sure you have a paper and a pen or a pencil ready, okay? And if you have your nature journal, put it in your nature journal. It'll be awesome. Okay, so we are going to get started talking about feathers. Um, and feathers are so cool. They are part of what makes birds very special. Um, so other birds have wings, right? Other animals have wings. There's lots of insects that fly. There are bats that fly. So wings are not, the, they're not something that only birds have. Um, same thing with beaks. There are turtles that have beaks. Did you know a turtle, their, their mouth is called a beak? Very cool. Um, dinosaurs had beaks too. So feathers are, feathers are the only thing that birds have that no other animal has. Um, maybe not the only thing, but one of the big things. So feathers are so important in um, making a bird a bird. And they help keep birds dry, they help keep birds warm, and they help birds to fly. And they're just great. I do want to share that most birds in the United States are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And so th it's they're protected, which means that you can't have feathers or nests or bird parts or bird bodies or live birds, live or dead. Um, so if you find feathers out in the wild, it's okay to touch them and pick them up and look at them, but you should leave them out there. Um, and it's, it's technically illegal to have them. So Madison Audubon um, and lots of other places have permits that allow us to keep feathers or eggs or nests. And Madison Audubon uses them for teaching. Some places use the, the things that they find for science. Maybe they'll do experiments or research with them um, for teaching. Um, so that, that's why I have feathers to show you today. <laughs> um, this actually is a turkey feather though. And so there are, if uh, game species, you are allowed to have feathers for. So um, a turkey is an animal that you can hunt in Wisconsin. And so if you have a hunting license and you did go and hunt a turkey, you can keep the feathers of it. So if you have questions about what sorts of feathers you I would love to answer that for you. All right, so I said that feathers help uh, keep birds dry. And I wanna start there because I think that's really cool. So there's all sorts of different feather shapes and the feathers, uh, feathers on a bird's body are, uh, they're shaped differently depending on where they are on the bird's body. So feathers along the wing, um, those are shaped to help the bird fly. Feathers along the body are shaped to help a bird stay warm and dry. And this is a body feather. It's called a contour feather of a swan. And actually, this one is a mute swan. Um, so this is a f the body feather of a swan. It is very, very large. And actually, I have a body feather from a duck, which is much smaller. But both of these feathers... They have a midline here, 
and they have this midline runs right down the middle of either side of the feather and it's a little bit curved and it has some fluffy stuff at the end this helps keep the bird warm a bit and it has this more rigid area right here and this is the part that helps keep the bird dry and when all of these feathers are laying on the bird's body they sort of overlap like this um, I wonder if I have another feather hmm, I'll use this one pretend this is the same one they sort of overlap like this and so when rain falls on the bird it just rolls right down the bird's feathers um, and so as long as the feathers are in good condition the bird mostly stays dry which is so cool so these body feathers are a little bit like a raincoat for the bird okay um, let's look at the feathers that keep the bird warm so this is a body feather, and I actually don't know which species of bird this came from. We should look it up later. Uh, so these little soft parts of the feather, they don't have very much structure to them. They're very flowy. If I blow on them, can you see? Hmm, like that's better, I think. They move around a lot. They're very fluffy, and they move in all directions. Um, so it's equally fluffy all the way around the feather if I spin it. And these feathers, this part down here is downy and it helps keep, it traps a lot of air near the bird's body. And when that air is heated by the bird's body, it's like the birds are carrying around a little bubble of warmth as they move around. So these feathers really help keep the bird warm. And these ones are under the contour feathers. So these feathers help the, uh, help the water roll off the bird or snow. They keep it dry. And these feathers keep the bird warm underneath. It's very cool. It's like wearing uh, a warm sweatshirt underneath your raincoat. Birds are awesome. <laughs> all right, and then I said that feathers also help birds fly. And all of the feathers, well, most of the feathers on the bird's wings, the big ones, those are called flight feathers and their tail is also called, it's made up of flight feathers. Um, and wing feathers and tail feathers have very different shapes depending on the type of bird you're looking at. But the big difference, and these come from different birds and they're very different sizes. <laughs> um, the big difference is that tail feathers, this middle part goes mostly right down the middle of the feather. And these other parts are sort of equal on each side. Okay, and with flight feathers, this is a primary feather. That means it's near the edge of the wing, the tips of the wing. This middle part here is not right in the center of the feather. It's much wider on one part than on the other part. This part is narrower. Um, so this one is a tail feather. And I wonder if anyone can guess what kind of bird it came from. It was a big bird. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that in the comments. You, you guys, or you all, type in what kind of bird you think this came from. Don't think too hard about it. I told you it was a tail feather. Look at the color. <laughs> um, all right, so these tail feathers are important in helping a bird steer. So they can move their tail to the left or the right. Kind of like, um, has anybody ever used their hands to steer a sled when they're sledding downhill? Um, or maybe if you have flippers on, using them to help you steer while you're swimming. Um, that's how birds use their tail feathers, a little bit like a rudder. Oh, like you're paddling a boat. Maybe that was the best analogy yet. <laughs> um, so these feathers help the birds steer while they're flying. And then these flight feathers, um, these are what creates lift. So the air, because the feather is bent like this, the air moves faster. Oh gosh, now I'm blanking on this. <laughs> oh no. Um, the air moves faster over the, over the wing than it does under the wing. And so that creates the lift that helps the bird fly upwards. Um, and it's all because of the feather shape, the way it's curved like this and the way it's curved like this. Oh, we're getting guesses on the feather now. There's a delay and it's very weird. Um, so. So Jeanette got it right. She said a red-tailed hawk. 
Yes, this feather came from a red-tailed hawk, a tail feather. Uh, this was a really cool feather to find, and I love teaching with it. Um, and it's actually a little bit more orangey than it is red. Um, when they when they're all together, it's a much more intense color when the whole tail is there. But with just one feather, it it's a lot paler than you would think. Um, just just looking at it. Okay, um, so this feather is one of the outer primary feathers of a goose. It's very large um, and very very brown. <laughs> um, but the fact that the this this part is wider than this part that is. Um, a really good adaptation for uh, strong flyers. So a lot of birds that are very strong flyers have wing feathers like this. Really cool. All right, so we talked about how feathers keep birds dry, they keep birds warm, and they help birds fly. Now I want to show you up close a little bit more what feathers look like. So I have this cool diagram of a feather. Right? And all the words are backwards, so don't, don't try to read them. <laughs> so we have, this is showing the anatomy of a feather. And this midline right here is the quill right there. Um, and I don't know if you've watched old time movies or um, Harry Potter, they write with quills a lot. And this is definitely something that you can still do. Got to find a feather that's legal to have. Um, but people used to just snip the end off the feather and make a little snip right here too. And then you can dip it right into ink and it'll hold the ink and you can write with it. And you have to keep going back and dipping, but it's really fun. Um, but this is, so they, they would call that a quill, like, oh, give me a quill. Or Hermione's always saying, I need a new quill. Um, that's, this is the part that they're talking about, the quill. Um, so that part there, this, this part that runs along the midline, can also be called the feather shaft or stem, um, but the word scientists use most is rachis, and I love the way that sounds, the rachis, the feather rachis. So whenever we're talking about a rachis, it's this part here, and it's a very strong part of the feather. Very cool. All right, so then... From here, we're going to look at this part zoomed in. So here is the rachis, again, very, very magnified. And coming off of the rachis are all of these barbs, all right? And when you look at this feather, if I spread it just a little, you can kind of see, oops, see they split along the barbs. Um, you can see little lines, maybe. Maybe my camera is not good enough for that. But all of those little splits are the barbs. And if you have a feather at home that you can sort of gently, gently, gently pull apart, you can see the barbs. Um, and so then coming off of the barbs, coming off of these barbs are all of these barbules. And these barbules sort of move over each other and sort of intertwine like this. And that helps make the feather really strong because they have to flap all day and they move through the wind and the, the air really, really quickly. Um, and so this feather needs to be both strong and really flexible. And so having all of these parts that sort of interlock, they really make it both strong and flexible. Okay, so we talked about the rachis, we talked about the barb, we talked about the barbules, and then coming off the barbules, little, little hooks that all grab onto each other so that they can become an interwoven, well, an interwoven flat shape like this. And they all cling together. And the really neat thing is, that I wish, usually when I teach this in person, I pass out a bunch of feathers that kids can see. And the thing that's really cool about feathers is that you can split them like this, or you can even, kids love poking through with pencils and then splitting it. But because of the way the hooklets don't break when that happens, they just sort of let go, you can smooth the feather back into shape and it's pretty close to good as new. If you, if you smooth it well enough, 
that spot is not a weak point anymore. And that's what birds are doing when they're preening. So preening is what it's called when birds are cleaning their feathers and making sure they're all in the right place and in good condition. And part of preening is moving the birds, the bird moves its beak along its feathers like this, and that helps smooth all of the barbs and barbules and hooklets all into place again so their feathers are strong and really useful for flying. Um, some other things birds do when they preen is make sure the feathers are positioned correctly. Sometimes um, they'll fluff up and shake their feathers and then when they smooth them back down again, they're all in the right spot. Um, sometimes they'll move their beak around inside their feathers and just sort of smooth it and uh, make sure they're, they're, they're where they should be. Um, birds also have uh, something called a uropigial gland. Everybody say that, uropigial. Uropigial. <laughs> Maybe, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, uropigial glands is an oil gland at the base of their tail, sort of right where their tail and their back meet. And birds will often reach back with their beak and they'll, they'll wipe their beak on that oil gland and then they'll spread that oil over their feathers. And some birds, like ducks and geese, have a really active uropigial gland. Um, because those birds spend a lot of time in the water and they need their feathers to be um, very buoyant and waterproof. And so that very special oil that their bodies produce helps to keep the feathers um, right where they should be and uh, working well. So feather structure, the rachis, the barbs, the barbules, and the hooklets all help the feathers to be strong and light and flexible. Uh, feathers are just an amazing adaptation that birds have. It's very cool. Maybe someday we'll do a lesson on the evolution of feathers. That would be really fun. Um, all right, so we looked at the feather anatomy. So now I wanna try <laughs> using my magnifying glass, not, not a magnifying glass, a microscope and this one is really neat because it just clips right onto my, my phone and it goes over the camera. So when I put it on, you all should see exactly what I see through this. Um, but it might take a little fiddling with, okay? So try to be patient. And if it seems like it's just not gonna work, then maybe I'll post some, um, I'll post some pictures in the comments, okay? So first, I'm going to turn the light on so that all the pictures are really bright, okay? Next, I'm gonna reverse my camera so that I can see what you see. Okay, now I'm gonna put the camera or my microscope over the camera and it's very blurry right now. Okay, now I'm gonna zoom in and let's see, let's see if this will work. Rotate it that way. Ooh. Okay, so what we're looking at right now is a red-tailed hawk tail feather. And it's dancing all around. I'm sorry about that. But you can see those big horizontal lines kind of going across and up to the right. Those are the barbs. And let's go find that rachis. There is the rachis right in the middle of the feather. And you can see where all of the barbs are coming off of the rachis in the middle. And this side is actually a little bit easier. All of those little fluffy lines coming up and down. I wish I had a mouse to show you where, to point to where I want you to look. So the barbs, the barbs themselves are a little bit reddish. The barbules are more grayish white and they're little fluffy fingers reaching out to hold the other parts of the feather. Let's go look at the tip of the feather. Ooh, where did you go? Oh, I don't think the tip is gonna be worth looking at right now. <laughs> okay, so that was the feather of a red-tailed hawk. How about we look at that really long goose primary feather? These almost look like the barbs and the barbules are much tighter, 
much more tightly woven. And the red-tailed hawk feather was a little bit old, uh, meaning that the bird, uh, it was very worn when it, when it dropped that feather. Um, and so, oh, hey, Jim Berkelman, it's good to see you. <laughs> so these barbs and the barbules of this feather um, are both probably less worn, but also much tighter because it's a primary flight feather. Um, and you can see how very, how very tight they are. Let me see if I can separate that feather like I was showing you. Let's see if I can find that with my microscope. It's a little tricky. There's where that break is that I just created. And you can see that fluffy end with all the barbules and the hooklets reaching out for the other end. I wonder if I can sneak them back together while I'm using the microscope. Oh, there we go. Okay, so you can see, maybe, I didn't smooth it over quite as well, so you can see the little gap right there. Let's smooth it again. All right, and now you can see that the feather is all back together. Really cool up close. Okay, let's look at a different feather. I wanna show you that body contour feather of a duck. Let's look at that up close. Oops. Hmm. Sorry, this is taking a little longer. This feather is much smaller than the other one. There we go. This one has some color change in it, which is a little tricky to see with the microscope. And I am sorry, I can only focus on one plane at once. So every time I move the feather, uh, most of the picture is out of focus. There's the rachis. You can see the barbs and the barbules all reaching out to each other. So close, and this is this this uh, microscope is at sixty times magnification. We're traveling up the rachis to the very end. Oh, there's the end of the feather. Hey, this one's working a lot better than the red-tailed hawk did. That's kind of cool. All right, now. I'm gonna show you that fluffy down feather. Oh, these are the super fluffy uh, barbs and barbules of that downy feather. And see how there's almost no structure to this at all, uh, at least compared to those flight feathers. These are so wispy and fluffy and light. And they have evolved to trap air close to the bird's body so that the bird's body can warm that air and make it a little warm bubble that it carries around with them. <laughs> this microscope is hard to use like this, guys. Thank you for being patient. And then up at the very tip of this feather, remember, there is a little bit of structure to it. And that's that very, very loose structure. The barbs and the barbules are much less rigid than in the flight feathers. So cool. Oh, okay, I think I have showed you all of the up close stuff I want to show you. Ha. So if anyone has questions about that, please type it in the comments. Or if anyone wants to see one of those again, maybe we can do that at the very end. Um, okay, but now I want to do our experiment. This is a pretty cool one. It explores oil and water and um, what, what, bird, what bird feathers do <laughs> when encountering both. And so for this experiment, I have two um, feathers. They're, they're just craft feathers that you would buy at you know, Joann's or Michael's or any crafty store like that. And these, these came from chickens. Um, so these feathers are okay to have. So if you see feathers in craft stores, um, they're, they're most likely chicken feathers or other game birds that, that we eat. Um, so these are feathers I found at a store. Um, if you want to do this experiment at home now, um, you could also look in a feather pillow if you have one of those, or if you have a down coat. You know how sometimes the feathers poke out a little bit, and you can uh, just grab the end of it and gently, gently, gently pull it out of your coat, and you should be able to use that. 
Um, and Sherry asked that microscope is great. Where can I get one? I just bought mine online. Um, so it's just a 60 powered clip on microscope for your phone. And it is really cool. I've been having a lot of fun with it, taking all kinds of pictures. Um, I think later on, I'm going to put out a backyard micro explorers scavenger hunt for kids so they can see the pictures that I took really up close and try to find the the big thing outside. Um, yeah, so if you just look for, for clip-on phone microscopes, you should, you should find one that works. Um, all right, so for this experiment, I have two feathers. I have three dishes of water. Um, I have one very old and sticky bottle of vegetable oil. <laughs> um, and I have one bottle of Dawn dish soap. And this dish soap really does work the best um, if you're going to do this experiment. Um, okay, so what I want to do is first have my clean water, just water, and I have my feather. And I'm just going to set the feather on top. My fingers are sticky from that, that oil though. I'm going to set the feather on top and let's see, let's point this down a little bit. How's that? Hmm, that works pretty well. And this feather is just floating right on top of the water. Oh, it doesn't like when I turn my phone that much. Let's do it right here. Um, so this feather is just floating right on top of the water. The feather structure is still pretty similar to what it was when I put it in. It's a little bit wet, but all of the barbs and the barbules are, are in the right place. And even if I put the feather underwater, it floats back up. Looks very wet right now though, <laughs> but it does float back up. Okay. Now I am going to take another dish of clean water. And I'm just going to put a few drops of oil on it. If I can open this bottle, it's been a while. There we go. And remember how I said that birds have that uropygial gland? Um, it's oil that they produce. So that is special oil that is really good for their feathers. Oil like this, um, and this, this is oil that, that we could eat. I mean, I cook with this all the time. Not this bottle, but I do. Um, but... The oil that we're talking about here is like if there's an oil spill or if oil from your car gets into the environment and then a bird finds it, that's the oil that we're trying to mimic with this one, all right? But that's not safe to use in classrooms, so we use vegetable oil. So just pour a little bit of vegetable oil onto your water and look at whether or not the oil sinks or floats. That's the first step in the experiment. And actually, this is a really good view for that. You can see the oil is caught in little um, little beads at the top of the surface. All the oil has clumped together, and it's floating right at the top. So I'm going to swirl it around a little bit, spread it out. And I'm going to take a dry feather, just for fun, and I'm going to set it in here on the oil. And it is floating. You see, it is floating right now. Um, but then if I, if I push it down and get it really coated in that oil, um, it, it floats less. <laughs> and when I pull it out, the feather really doesn't hold its shape at all. So now we have this oily feather. And I'm going to wipe my fingers off real quick so I'm not getting oil on the other feather. And this was our feather in just the water. And if I pull this feather out, this part down here with the structure, there we go. I can smooth it with my fingers and I can put the feather back into about the shape that it was before it went into the water. So this would be like a bird preening its feathers after it, after a big rainstorm, or after it uh, went swimming. Okay, so now this feather, the camera's having trouble with the light on this. <laughs> this feather is basically back to the shape that it was. All these little fluffy parts, they still need to dry out a little bit before I can put them back to the right shape. Um, when it is in oil though, it's coated with this big slimy slick 
uh, layer that clings to the feathers and it I can't really clean it out very well with just my fingers and it's really hard to get this feather back into the same shape it was before it went into the oil so a bird on its own is not going to have very much luck cleaning oil off of its feathers all right so now we need our third bowl of clean water <laughs> and we need a little bit of that Dawn dish soap and I'm actually gonna put it right on the feather because that'll be a little quicker and I'm gonna use the dish soap and the water to clean the oil off of the feather let's see if I can get a good view of this again this feather with just the and with only doesn't take very much time but this feather is very very thin <laughs> uh, because all of those barbs and barbs are fluffed out again and dried but now that there's no oil on it oh there's still I'm going to rinse it off again. All right, I've rinsed it. Used all the water out. There's no oil on it. A bird can with just their beak and put it back to the structure that it was before. Um, and so oil makes it the feather structure um, so that's why oil spills are really birds our feathers warm and, and if they can't fly they can't find and if they can't stay warm well if they get too cold they could die from being cold um, so oil spills in bed are bad in general because of all the the chemicals it puts into the environment um, but they're really hard for birds too because it totally affects the way they move around their environment um, okay so that was a really cool experiment that you can try at home and explore how oil and water interact with feathers and how they um, how they change how feathers Oh, hey, I'm back. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for that delay. Um, my internet is, it struggles when two people are using it. And my husband was on a meeting and Zoom. Okay, so we looked at feathers up close. Um, we looked at feathers like this. And now it's time, oh, we did our experiment too. And now it's time to do eight minute notes. So if you have your pen and your paper, let's get started. Um, so the first thing we want to do as scientists is put our name on the paper and the date. And, oh goodness, I don't have the date anywhere. <laughs> oh, I do. The date is uh, May 27th. So you can write May 27th, 2020, or you can write 5-27-2020. Um, and once you have the na your name and the date on the paper, Next, you want to make a big plus sign, so you're dividing your paper into four pieces, okay? Um, and for each of the sections, each of the four sections, you're going to have two minutes to write the answer to the question that I ask you. And if you're, if you're not done in two minutes, that's okay, you can go back, um, but it's not something that you need to stress a lot about. So don't worry, don't, don't worry about writing in complete sentences or spelling words correctly. This is just for you and your nature journal to help you remember what you learned, okay? All right, so the first one, pick one of the boxes. I usually like the top left one first. Um, but for this one, I want you to write something that you learned today during this lesson. So something that um, either you learned from me or if there's another person there who is 
watching with you who had a cool fact that they shared or you looked up something that you had a question to, any of those you can write about. So you have two minutes to write about something you learned. Ready, go. And if there's anyone who's not doing eight minute notes or even if you are doing them and you have questions, now's a great time to type them into the comments so I can answer the questions while we're doing eight minute notes. I'm gonna take a drink of water. Cause it's good to stay hydrated when it's so hot. Ah. Yep, Sherry, I'm sorry. I know the broadcast got interrupted and I'm in and out with sound. It's a rough day for internet, which I don't understand because it's so nice out. Usually the weather affects my internet a lot. Um, okay, so I wanna show you these two feathers while we're doing eight minute notes. Um, and you have a minute and 15 seconds left. So this is a turkey tail feather, and this is that red-tailed hawk tail feather. And remember that I said that tail feathers, they have that rachis going up the middle, but they have about equal distance of these barbs and barbules on the other sides. Um, and it's neat that these two different birds, um, they have a slightly different shape to it, right? The turkey's a lot bigger than the red-tailed hawk. Um, and so it makes sense that their tail feathers would be bigger. Um, but this feather is narrower down here and then gets wider at the top. And this feather is just a little bit wider right here and gets slightly narrower. Um, so they have a slightly different shape. But in general, the shape is very, very similar, which is kind of neat, even though they're very different birds. I like that. Um, and we have about 20 seconds left for our first eight minute note section. Um, and maybe another time we could do a class on feather color um, and how this brown color actually adds strength to the feather, which is kind of neat. I should write these all down. They're great ideas for lessons. Okay, stop. If you're doing eight minute notes, that was the end of the first section. So next I want you to move to the one uh, right next to where you were writing this time. And now you're gonna have two minutes to write something that you wonder. Ready, go. And wondering is really important because as a scientist, um, your main job is to ask questions and try to find the answer to them. Um, either, <laughs> I'll get to Joe's question in just a second. Um, you wanna try to find the answer to those, either by looking it up somewhere, if, if scientists already know the answer to that, or by going out and doing a study or an experiment to try and find the answer yourself. But the really important part to that is having the question, because if you don't have questions, you can't find the answers. So writing down what you wonder is really important. And I wonder lots of things. Um, let's see, you have one minute left to write down something you wonder. And I'm gonna talk about a few things that I wonder. Um, I wonder, what the weirdest looking feather is. <laughs> and I bet, it's, I bet it's a tail feather of a very fancy bird somewhere. Um, I wonder, this, this is a swan feather again. I wonder what that bird was doing to get such a ragged feather up here. All of the barbs and barbules on this side have sort of um, fallen off. The, the rachis goes all the way out to here. I wonder what this bird was doing with its feathers to make it so, to make it so rough. Um, oh, my husband is showing me a peacock feather right now. You're such a good assistant. I love it. <laughs> He's a bird nerd too. So this is a peacock feather. And we have this because my husband ties flies to use as um, lures while he's fly fishing. You have five seconds left to write down something you wonder. And this is a very specialized feather. And it's used uh, as a display to attract a mate. The male peacocks have these. Um, and their rachis is very, very long, and the barbs are very spaced out, so that so much so that these barbules can't reach together. Like you can't, you can't even smooth these feathers together if you wanted to. Um, and then up here, it's very iridescent. Do you see how it changes color when the light hits it differently? That would be a really cool part of the the feather color lesson to do. Um, this is a really, really neat feather to talk about. Thank you for sharing that, hon. All right, peacock feathers are cool. So next I'm going to get you started on the next section, and then we'll talk about how birds fly. Um, so pick another box on your, your four square there, 
And now I want you to write down something someone said. It can be something I said, like feathers are amazing, or it could be something that someone in your home said uh, or wherever you're watching this. So it could be um, someone said something, wow, that's cool, or they asked a question. Um, and you don't have to do this, but remember, if, if you want to practice writing what someone said correctly, um, you add quotes, quotation marks. So there's those two little lines up near the top of the letters and you have one when the thing they said starts and one where it ends. And then at the end, you usually write dad said or grandpa said, okay? Um, so write down something someone said and you have two minutes. So Joe, that's such a good question. I'm really glad you wanna know how birds fly. And there is a lot that goes into that. Maybe we'll need to do our own lesson just on how birds fly. So the first part is that they have feathers and feathers are very light and strong and they make their wings very large compared to their body size, usually. There's birds like ostriches and penguins that have smaller wings for their body size, but they don't fly, so that's okay. Um, so birds have feathers that, are, that make their wings very big um, and they also have a lot of really specialized bones. So bird bones are hollow, but strong. And because they're hollow, it makes them a lot lighter than our bones. If you were to hold um, like the bone of a robin, maybe like one of its wing bones, and the arm bone of say a chipmunk, so a robin and a chipmunk are about the same size, the bones of the chipmunk would probably be heavier than the bones of the robin. Um, that's because the robin bones are hollow. Um, another thing birds have is they have some fused bones and all in, so feel your hips. Those are, those are down where your legs meet your body. Those hip bones in there for us are not fused and our, our spine is not fused. We're, we're pretty flexible in our hips and our back. Um, with birds, a lot of those bones are all connected and that makes their hips and their lower back really, really strong because when they're landing or when they're taking off, they're doing a lot of, um, a lot of work with that part of their body and making them fused like that makes it a lot stronger to handle all that work. And I have completely lost track of how many minutes have gone by for our eight minute notes. So let's say you have 30 seconds left to write down something someone said and then we'll move on. Um, another adaptation that helps birds fly, helps make them lighter, is that they don't have teeth. Birds don't have teeth. So our teeth are really useful and they're really strong. They're good for chewing, um, but they're also really heavy. Uh, and it doesn't bother us because we're pretty strong animals and uh, most animals with teeth are strong too. Um, but if you're trying to fly, you wanna be as light as you possibly can to help you get off the ground. Um, and so birds don't have any teeth um, and they have beaks instead and talons that help them do what our teeth do. Um, and some birds have something called lamellae and those are little ridges along the edge of their beak, sort of like, like this, little ridges. And they look a bit like teeth, but they're not. They're just those ridges that help them grip things like, like fish, slippery fish or slippery water plants. Um, okay, so Joe, let me know if that answers your question about how birds fly. Um, oh, and the last part about that was the, the wing shape helps them fly. So because their wings are shaped in sort of like a rainbow shape, it's a little bit rounder on the top and flatter on the bottom, the air moves over their wing faster and slower underneath their wing, and that helps lift their wings up. That's a really important part of how birds fly. And it's been an entire minute since I said we had 30 seconds left. So stop, stop writing about something someone said. Now we're going to draw. So in your last section, your last little square of eight minute notes, I want you to draw something from today. And maybe you want to draw just a whole feather. Maybe you want to draw the hooks and the barbs and the barbules and the rachis. Maybe you want to draw what we saw in the microscope up close. I don't know. <laughs> so pick something to draw. Does anybody else have any more questions? We have just about a minute and a half left. What do you think? So I really like going on nature walks and looking for feathers. And um, I only keep them if I'm going to use them as a teaching tool. Otherwise, I leave them where they are. But it's really cool finding feathers because 
you know that that bird was in the area pretty recently. Feathers, they can last in the environment for a while, um, but they do break down eventually. So if you find a feather that looks beautiful on the ground, that bird probably lost it pretty recently. Um, and birds actually, they, they shed their feathers or molt them um, one or two or three times a year, depending on the species. Um, and so when their feathers fall out of their body, usually, it's a lot like when our hair falls out a little bit. So if you're, you're taking a shower, you run your fingers through your hair and you get a few pieces there, that's kind of like when a bird's feather falls out. Um, usually it doesn't hurt them at all and they just fall out of their, fall out of their body and they're replaced um, because those feathers, they do wear down. Um, so when you find a feather, usually the bird just lost it because it was time. Um, sometimes though, you can find a spot where another animal had a bird for a meal. Um, and it's a little sad for that bird, but it's really good for that animal who needed to eat or maybe feed their own babies. Um, so I like playing nature detective and finding out um, what the bird was that died and what the animal was that killed it. Um, and so even though it's a little sad to find something like that, I always think it's fun. And I like to get a good poke and stick and touch it and see what's going on. And then I wash my hands. Okay, so we're all done with drawing for eight minute notes, which means we're all done with eight minute notes. Um, and I have so many good lesson ideas now that I'm gonna write down immediately at the end of this lesson so that I can talk more about feathers another time. Um, so thank you everybody for joining. And I had a lot of fun teaching this one. Um, on Friday, so that would be the 29th, I'm gonna be doing a lesson at I think 10 a.m. Um, and we're going to be learning how to identify all of those little brown streaky birds, the ones that look like sparrows, might not be sparrows. Um, I love them. A lot of people don't, though. <laughs> uh, so look for me on Friday, same place, um, or catch it another time because they'll all be on, on our website, on YouTube, ready for you to watch whenever you need them. Um, so... Thanks so much for being here. And all of our programming is free online for all kinds of kids. So if you have the means and you want to support our programming, we'll put a link down at the bottom that'll take you to a donation page on our website. And we appreciate it. So thanks so much, everybody. Be safe, have fun, get outside, enjoy nature. Bye.